on this edition of the Fifth Estate, it seemed just another murder in Mexico, one of tens of thousands of violent killings here each year. But this was different. The victim a mother and career woman. In fact, a branch manager for the Canadian-owned Scotiabank. She was stabbed and cut. She, this is a woman who works in a bank, and it wouldn't take much to get her to cooperate. The death of manager Maru Oropesa would shine a spotlight on the dangers Canadian banks and their employees face in one of the most corrupt countries in the world. It was not only months, it was years uh, of hard work to uh, determine uh, every detail we could in order to bring the perpetrators to justice. Ahead, a story of Mexico, money, and murder. If the bank had taken countermeasures earlier, do you think she would still be alive? Yeah, sure. Sure. Hello, I'm Bob McEwen. Welcome to the Fifth Estate. It all started here, in this national forest outside Mexico City, with the discovery of a dead body in a roadside ditch. What happened next would lead to the Toronto headquarters of a major Canadian bank, to Switzerland and secret accounts with millions of dollars, and into a netherworld of Mexican drug cartels, money laundering, and murder. September 27, 2001, in Mexico City, began as most days did for Maru Oropesa. Scrambled eggs and tea for her boys' breakfast before sending them off to school. Then her drive to work, where she was always at her desk at the bank by 8 a.m. Maru was proud to be known as the hard-working manager of the Scotiabank branch in the affluent Mexico City neighborhood called Polanco. Her older son, Laro. The example that she let, that she gave us, that if you, if you want something, you need to work hard for it. That nothing is free in life. Polanco is an area of high-end restaurants, brand name shops, and the people who can afford them. Scotiabank's clients here include many wealthy investors. But while Maru managed their wealth at work, at home, her family had a little of its own with scant support from her ex-husband. We don't have a, a, like a lot of money. We don't have the, uh, like luxuries, but we live well. We, she works very hard, and we have like enough for us. Professionally and personally, Maru Oropesa had been spending time with a colleague. In fact, her former boss at Scotiabank. His name was Jaime Ross and he seemed quite different from the demure Maru. Ross is a very ambitious person at first. Former Mexican prosecutor Jose Luis Marmaleo. When you meet him, you see a, an intelligent one person, a very clean person in his, in his personality. He was well-educated, and uh, uh, he started climbing over the, the society to get some social position, and he gets it. Eventually, he gets it. In the Tony neighborhood of Polanco, Jaime Ross fit right in with his taste for expensive suits, pricey cars, and the good life. As an executive with Scotiabank, he was known as a man on the move. And what do you think he wanted to do when he got to that position? Power. Power. Using it, you can get into business, you can get into a government position, that, and that allows you to make more money or to operate in many, many ways. And Ross was climbing that ladder after he left Scotiabank to become vice president of another bank in Mexico. Maru Oropesa was promoted to replace him as Scotiabank branch manager, and the two stayed in touch. All the while, Maru discussed her personal life with friends, also Scotiabank employees, and she told them something surprising about the relationship. She had shared with them that she was seeing Jaime Ross, and that at dinner one night, he had made an audacious proposal. He said if she could transfer a large sum of money from one of the investment accounts at her branch to Switzerland, he would arrange a preferential interest rate. Then, 
when they repatriated the money to Mexico, they'd split the extra interest, and no one would be any the wiser. Maru's friend said he also promised her a $50,000 bonus to take part, a windfall for a single mom with two young sons. But there were signs Jaime Ross had even bigger plans for the money. And he's telling her, take that money out of here and you send it to Switzerland. Paul Cialino is an internationally known private investigator. He says however improbable Ross's financial scheme might sound, it seems Maru was listening to her heart, not her head. Even it might be improper, she's going, well, Jaime the genius is telling me to do it. What's the problem? Yeah. So I do it. So Jaime Ross opened a Swiss bank account, and Maru Oropesa signed off on the transfer of almost $5 million from her branch in Mexico City without the knowledge or approval of the person whose money it was. Maru's boys, Laro and Andres, say there was never any sign their mother received even a penny of those missing millions. Maybe you, when you become rich, you began to change the little things and get uh, little luxuries. Maybe you're used to breakfast scrambled eggs. If you become rich, you can uh, begin to breakfast salmon with Philadelphia cheese and maybe champagne. And there was no change no. like that in no, your no, lifestyle, days I continue lifestyle or, or uh, breakfast. Eating the scrambled eggs in breakfast. Yeah. But something was about to happen that would change their lives forever. On the evening of September 27th, Maru Oropesa had plans to meet someone for dinner. Her son, Laro, called to ask when she'd be back. In a couple of hours, she said, they couldn't know they'd never see each other again. After work that evening, Maru took a cab from Scotiabank, which dropped her off downtown about 7 p.m. Some familiar with what happened next believe she may well have gone to meet Jaime Ross. It was several hours later, about 2 a.m. on September 28th, when the telephone rang in the modest home Maru shared with her mother and boys. It was only then they realized her bed hadn't been slept in and she hadn't come home. Now, a stranger's voice on the telephone had a message that was almost unbelievable. And the phone call said what? That my mother had been kidnapped. The caller demanded 300,000 pesos, almost $30,000. He said he'd call back. All the family could do was wait. So you just wait by the phone? Yeah. All night? Yeah. Well, you can't go to sleep with... Uh... With that feeling and knowing that your mom has been kidnapped. Yeah. All night they waited, but the second call never came. Because as you'll see, the case of Maru Oropesa was so much more than a kidnapping. When we come back, what happened next would trigger one of the biggest investigations in Scotiabank history. Because we wanted to get to the, the bottom of what happened, uh, because we took it so seriously. And what they would find, the money trail leading to some very troubling questions. Clearly she's being questioned, and they're using some torture to see if she's telling the truth in their opinion. By September 2001, almost $5 million were gone from a large investment account at this Scotiabank branch in Mexico City. The account holder hadn't discovered that yet, nor had Scotiabank, because the transaction had been hidden by the branch manager, Maru Oropesa. But now Maru was missing. She hadn't come home to her two young sons the night before, and a terrifying telephone call said she'd been kidnapped. It was just a day later, about 8 a.m., that a man returning from working the night shift was walking home through the National Forest outside Mexico City. In the undergrowth, he caught a glimpse of something he thought looked human. In fact, it was Maru Oropesa, the foliage hiding most of her body. According to the police report obtained by the Fifth Estate, Maru had been cut with a knife numerous times on her chest, neck, and face before being stabbed in the torso and bleeding to death internally. Former Chicago homicide investigator Paul Cialino 
says those injuries persuade him this was no random killing. These are torture injuries, or signs of torture. Uh, you know, there's no signs of sexual assault on her. Clearly, she's being questioned. Yeah. And, and they're trying to get answers, and she's clearly uh, <laughs> under some duress. And Cialino says he's concluded there was no kidnapping, that the alleged kidnap call was to distract the police, not to extract a ransom. This woman was killed to silence her, not to get money from a family with no money. Yeah. And if you're going to kidnap her, you call the bank, right? If you're going to call her bosses at the bank and hit them with yeah. a big number, right? That, that's, that's a legitimate kidnap call. But for Maru's boys, who knew nothing of her personal relationships, there were only the agonizing questions. Who could have killed her? For what reason would someone so brutally murder their loving mother? Just nine and 13 at the time, today they cling to the hope that if she were involved in the fraud, it could only have been to protect them. The thing that I, was, uh, that I have always supposed is that in some way they threat uh, her to hurt her family. I don't find another reason that my mother could accept something like that. But ever since, they've had few answers, as with the loved ones of most Mexican murder victims. For years, Mexico has suffered through a murder epidemic fueled by its drug wars. You are now 14 times more likely to become a homicide victim here than in Canada. And here's another statistic. In Canada, three quarters of murder cases will eventually be resolved by the justice system. In Mexico, over 80% of homicides will remain unsolved forever. At first, the Mexican police believed Maru's murder was a kidnapping gone wrong. And in the early days, there were few theories or leads But back in Toronto, when the terrible news of their manager's murder reached Scotiabank executives, they soon realized there was another possibility. Hi, Bob. Diane Flanagan. Nice to meet you. Thank you. Have a seat. Diane Flanagan is the bank's vice president for communications. Is the immediate conclusion that as a bank manager in Mexico and, and given the general criminal environment there that the two are related, her job and her death? Well, we, we launched a very thorough and serious investigation uh, because we wanted to get to the, the bottom of what happened uh, because we took it so seriously. Uh, so uh, we sent investigators from Toronto to assist our, our Mexican investigators. Uh, and it was not only months, it was years uh, of hard work to uh, determine uh, every detail we could in order to bring the perpetrators to justice. Eventually, they would focus on one account at the Scotiabank branch in Polanco, an account under the supervision of Maru, the manager. At the time, U.S. federal agent Gabe Gonzalez was assigned to the American Embassy in Mexico. Part of a task force to clamp down on Mexican money laundering, he agreed to assist the Scotiabank investigation. Keep going back to the money trail because when Money is moved from one bank to another bank, and bank accounts are opened. There's a trail there. And as investigators followed the money trail, one name kept coming up, Jaime Ross. These are wires that are coming out of the victim's account in Switzerland and going to Ross's bank accounts. Agent Gonzalez says the former Scotiabank executive had the perfect CV for a major money laundering fraud. Ross was very intelligent astute person. He knows the banking system. So that was the other thing is he knew how the banking system worked and he knew what officials would be looking for. It took over a year, but they finally discovered where the millions illegally sent by Maru Oropesa to Jaime Ross's Swiss account ended up. Transferred through a maze of accounts in banks and shell corporations in five countries, they learned the money ultimately arrived in the U.S. There, it was used to purchase three aircraft, a Learjet, an Augusta helicopter, and a Cessna caravan, 
all with Jaime Ross registered as owner. So the Scotiabank money had been spent on the planes, but now those planes had disappeared, gone without a trace. At that point, did you know where the aircraft were? No, we had no clue where the aircraft were. And where was Jaime Ross? Well, after the discovery of Maru's body, Ross wasn't questioned. He was living the good life. Funded by the frauds, he ran an airline and was an owner of Italian designer boutiques, still very much a man on the move. Then, out of the blue, American agent Gabe Gonzalez got a tip about the Learjet purchased with the laundered Scotiabank money. It had filed a flight plan from Mexico to Florida. I mean, as soon as the plane landed, uh, we were able to seize the plane. Once on U.S. soil, Ross's Learjet was impounded and sold. The funds returned to Scotiabank. Jaime Ross was charged with fraud and money laundering. A fugitive for months, he was finally arrested in the resort city of Cancun, tried, convicted, and sentenced to 15 years. So as far as Scotiabank was concerned, it seemed the case was closed. But was it? After the break, there were two mysteries yet to solve. Why had Maru Oropesa been killed? And how high up did the money trail go? As far as on the corruption, it was at the high levels there at the bank, which were the people that had the authority to be able to move money back and forth. Mexico can be a very good place to be very rich. And not only is that true for those with a great deal of money, but also for the banks to which they entrust it. It's an attractive commercial market for foreign bankers with Mexican mortgage rates around 20%. Interest rates on credit card balances, almost 50%. Then there's the dirty money. Because Mexico is a world leader in illicit drugs, it has the proceeds of crime to match illicit cash that has to be cleansed. Just ask its former chief money laundering prosecutor, Jose Luis Marmaleo. Money laundering is the, the main criminal activity in Mexico and, and not even in, in our country, in the world. Because you know, every crime, except the passional crimes, finally will have just one intention, to get money. In all, it is a trillion dollar Mexican money laundering industry. Trillion. Trillion with, with a, a T. Yeah, we're not talking millions here, trillion. Washington attorney Jack Blum is a former U.S. Senate investigator who's also worked extensively with the United Nations in the fight against money laundering. He says the appeal of banking in Mexico, for some, is not conventional business like mortgages or credit cards. If you could do honest business, there's honest business to be done. The problem is a, is a different one. It's a problem of where is the profit? The profit margin for the bank is very small. Uh, so the premium customer is the customer who's the criminal. And that customer is going to pay anything you ask for the banking service. The most recent case in point, over the past few years, authorities detected transfers of over a trillion dollars in illicit funds, much of it drug money from the Mexican cartels. Two major banks, the US-based Wachovia and the British HSBC, were fined almost $2 billion for their complicity in it. In the case of HSBC, they were receiving cash from the drug traffic. They literally designed boxes for the cash that would fit through the teller windows of their banks in Mexico. And in Mexican banking today, another of the biggest brand names is Scotiabank, Mexican subsidiary of Scotiabank Canada. Scotiabank may be Canada's third largest bank, but of Canadian banks internationally, it's number one with 73,000 employees in over 3,000 branches in 55 different countries. And after Canada and the US, Scotiabank's most profitable operation is in Mexico. Attorney Jack Blum says Scotiabank knew, 
or should have known what was at stake in Mexico. The problem of illicit money is a huge, huge problem for the banks. Uh, there's reputational risk, there's legal risk. Uh, there's risk in the home country, there's risk in the country where they're operating. And not the least of them are dangers faced by bank employees, like Scotiabank manager Maru Oropesa, tortured and killed after that $5 million fraud with her former Scotiabank boss, Jaime Ross. Now, she was dead, he was behind bars, and for Scotiabank, the investigation was taking an unwelcome turn. It had grown dramatically from the original Canadian bank investigators to include law enforcement from the US and Mexico, an unprecedented collaboration. And when they went looking, they would find that Jaime Ross, Maru Oropesa, and that first fraud of almost $5 million were just the beginning. US agent Gabe Gonzalez. During the process of the investigation of uh, this par particular fraud, uh, which was $4.9 million, we discovered another fraud uh, that he had actually done with another banking official with the same bank. Scotiabank. Scotiabank, correct. And that was uh, approximately $9 million. So $9 million more were missing from a second Scotiabank branch, also orchestrated by Jaime Ross, and the farther investigators tossed their net, the more perpetrators they hauled in. They discovered a total of 16 other staff were involved at almost all levels of the bank, including a cashier, a manager, even an executive director in Mexico City. As far as on the corruption, it was at the high levels there at the bank, which were the people that had the authority to be able to move money back and forth. So for their roles in the theft of a total of $14 million, how many of those 16 Scotiabank staff were criminally charged? The Mexican prosecutor for money laundering and organized crime then was Jose Luis Marmaleo. Were any of those people charged? No. Why not? No, because they never get charges into them. And that, that's an unexplicable thing that I never understand why the bank never present charges against them. So it was the bank's decision not to charge not to them. do it. Yeah. According to Marmaleo, under Mexican law, in the case of a financial crime in a bank, bank employees can only be charged if the bank itself first files a criminal complaint against them. But Scotiabank apparently made the decision not to do that. It fired those 16 employees. Scotiabank Vice President Diane Flanagan. Ultimately, the investigation determined that, uh, that there was uh, reason f uh, to uh, fire them for lack of oversight, yes. Why were they not prosecuted? Why were they not given to the authorities with the information you had and, and, and charges pressed by the bank so this could be executed in the court of law? Well, whenever we determined that there was enough information uh, to hand over to authorities, we did so. Uh, in this case, we detected issues, we investigated those issues, and we acted accordingly, which was to uh, terminate the employment of those people. Can you see how there's room for at least a little skepticism when a bank may be facing a lot of bad publicity because 16 of its staff members have been involved in multi-million dollar frauds, and they control whether or not those people are charged, prosecuted, and potentially sent to, to prison. I'm pretty sure the authorities control whether they decide to pursue charges against an individual. What we do is not, we provide Not if it involves a financial institution according to Mexican law. Unless a financial institution presses charges against its employees, the prosecution is unable to pursue it. Bob, I would be happy to go back and look at the details there. Uh, to get to the bottom of what you're asking. Uh, but I can assure you that we went out of our way to provide authorities with all the information that we could to assist in prosecution and ultimately convictions. In fact, Scotiabank did come back to us with a letter from their Mexican lawyer acknowledging they had filed a criminal complaint that resulted in the fraud charges against Jaime Ross. 
but the letter insisted it was up to prosecutors to pursue others who were responsible, not the bank. According to the former chief prosecutor for money laundering and organized crime in Mexico, that's simply not right. Jose Marmaleo prosecuted and convicted Jaime Ross. He says he was ready and willing to charge the 16 Scotiabank employees who were involved in the fraud. But without a specific criminal complaint from the bank, he couldn't do it. And Marmaleo insists Scotiabank's decision to fire those 16 employees only encouraged even more fraud. If you just put them in the street, that's not the solution to the problem, you know? You're only creating a potential criminal because you're putting in the, in the main street a person that has or have the knowledge of how to move um, all the money inside an, an institution like Scotia Bank. In fact, investigators soon discovered the problems at Scotiabank in Mexico went far beyond 16 employees and $14 million. In the years to come, Mexican banking regulators found other frauds involving bank staff. Because they get many, many uh, uh, evidence that they were getting into frauds, and major frauds cases, with the debit cards and also the credit cards that were given to the people that were in a retirement state in Mexico. Jose Marmaleo says Scotiabank staff throughout Mexico forged ATM cards to systematically skim millions from the retirement accounts of Mexican pensioners. And regulators found millions of dollars more in bogus Scotiabank loans given to bank employees, their families, and friends. They point to a record of fraud within Scotiabank, Mexico whether it's credit cards and ATM cards being forged to skim off retirement accounts, whether it's bogus loans being given to friends and family that aren't expected to be paid back. Fraud is an ever-present risk for all industry around the world. It's a constantly evolving threat in Canada and around the world. We work very hard to stay one step ahead of um, the next type of fraud. Nevertheless, allegations of wrongdoing at Scotiabank in Mexico kept piling up for over a decade. Embarrassing news stories about fraud and money laundering. Top executives let go amid reports of bribery and embezzlement. Scotiabank fined for inadequate controls over its transfers and deposits. Yet to the best of our knowledge, little if any of it has ever been made public back in Canada to Scotiabank customers or shareholders. Meanwhile, back in Mexico, the damage has been reported all the way up to Scotiabank's executive suite. How high a level? What executives? This case finally ends in the destitution of the main director in, in Mexico of Scotiabank. That main director he refers to was Scotiabank's Mexican CEO, Nicole Reich de Polignac, in 2012, she and the bank found themselves at the center of a political furor after opposition politicians accused them of facilitating an illegal deposit to an account controlled by Mexico's new president. The bank said it was a legal transaction and any confusion was due to a reporting error. But just a couple of weeks later, after a visit by a delegation from head office in Toronto, Nicole Reich de Polignac suddenly quit for reasons of professional development, the press release said. Again, there was virtually no mention of it back in Canada. Jose Marmaleo maintains the CEO's resignation was no coincidence. It was not the first time that Scotia Bank was under investigation. We have a serial historial on it. The Mexican authorities were not uh, trusting Scotia Bank and uh, all of that together gets finally into the resignation of this woman. When we return, what really happened the night Maru Oropesa died? Uh, there are people with motivations to have killed her. There's people that don't have a good alibi. There's people that are in and around the area. There's people who had strong motivation to kill her. And knowingly or not, did the bank's actions help or hinder a murder investigation? The important thing for us uh, was to investigate thoroughly and to provide that information to authorities. Um, no, what? that's not what they say. Okay. Mexico.
for over a decade, the Canadian-owned Scotiabank was reeling with the discovery of frauds totaling millions of dollars and implicating numerous bank employees and executives. But to truly understand what happened, you've got to go back to the murder mystery that started it all. It was September 27, 2001, when Scotiabank manager Maru Oropesa left home to meet someone for dinner and never returned. She was found brutally murdered two days later, signs of torture on her body. The family says that initially the bank promised financial support after the death of their branch manager. But then, when the involvement of Maru Oropesa in the multi-million dollar fraud became apparent, perhaps understandably, no money ever came. And now, a dozen years later, no one, not the bank, not money laundering investigators, not the Mexican police, has ever explained who killed Maru, or why? In Mexico, murder is the jurisdiction of the local police, widely known to be corrupt. Maru's family says they've had to pay thousands of dollars to local authorities just to keep the case alive. So are you, are you telling me that your family had to pay the yeah. prosecutors to investigate your mother's murder? Yeah, we need to, to pay to make the things going easier and, and faster. Former Chief Prosecutor Jose Marmaleo. According to Maru's sons, they paid $6,000 US dollars for a copy of the, of the police report. They paid for his vacation. Wow. Only in Mexico. The pain in the family, mm -hmm. it never ends, you know, because you never get a guilty. You never get an answer on what happens, what really happens. Yeah. And I think that's not fair. So we went looking for answers and set out to piece together what happened the night Maru Oropesa died. Remember, she'd told friends Jaime Ross had promised to repay the money they'd taken from the Scotiabank account. But that didn't happen. What's more, she was a single cog in a criminal web involving so many Scotiabank employees, both below her and above. It's understandable if she felt anxious. Because she was not more in control on that money. I mean, at the end, if you get in, in deep in this case, she never get one cent on that money. All the money went into Ross, into many people, but not her. She was scared. Certainly, she was very scared. But Scotiabank Vice President Diane Flanagan maintains there was something a frightened Maru could have done. The, the only other thing I could point to is that she could have reached out to somebody in human resources. She could have reached out to somebody in security and investigation. Uh, there were other avenues that she could have reached out for help. Except if there were 15 people in the Scotiabank organization there who knew this was going on, how could she know who she could trust? Human resources, security and investigation, those could have been two Her superior two was involved. The cashier below her was involved. How, how could she know who she could trust? And it's clear now that the stakes were life or death. Well, all we know is that there was a lack of supervision and, and people were, that's not tolerable, and, and people were disciplined and fired for that. And the bank took this very seriously. Whatever role Scotiabank Human Resources might realistically have played, what's clear now is that the local Mexican police never took the investigation of Maru's murder seriously. In fact, in the 145 pages of the homicide report obtained by the Fifth Estate, there is no mention whatsoever of Jaime Ross, though virtually everyone to whom we have spoken who's knowledgeable about the case agrees that the relationship between Maru Oropesa and Ross was at the very heart of the fraud, and quite possibly of her death. We asked private investigator Paul Cialino to review the available testimony and other evidence about the last night of Maru's life. We know that there's a relationship with Jaime we know that Jaime is planning on having dinner with her that night, or we suspect a strong suspicion of that happening, and she turns up missing. The clues are stacking up. You, you could come in a room and kick them over and still have more clues. Yeah.
Jose Marmaleo agrees her death must somehow have been connected to the fraud and Jaime Ross. And she has all the, all the, the main information that can put in risk uh, this operation, this entire uh, criminal activities that were taken uh, by Ross and, and his accomplices. So somehow they, they ordered to, to be murdered. So if Jaime Ross had the motive for murder, did he also have the opportunity? Well, consider this. According to Mexican cell phone records, at and around 7 p.m. that evening, when a cab dropped off Maru Oropesa for dinner in central Mexico City, Jaime Ross's cell phone initiated a number of calls from the same downtown location. The estimated time of Maru's death was about one o'clock that morning, and an hour later, her family got that supposed kidnap call from a public phone in the area known as Toluca, outside Mexico City. Where was Jaime Ross then? Again, according to cell phone records, from just before Maru's estimated time of death at 1 a.m., for the next several hours, Jaime Ross's phone made or received 38 calls, all in the vicinity of Toluca and the National Forest, where Maru's body was found. Former homicide investigator Paul Cialino. He made or received 38 calls in the vicinity of Toluca in, in those hours before and immediately after when she would have died. Is there such a thing as a coincidence in an investigation well, like this? Well, not 38 of them, okay? How's that for an answer? Clearly, he's communicating with somebody on a very frequent basis mm -hmm. and kind of rapid fire phone calls back and forth. That, that's an, another thing we would call a, a clue. Yeah. And that's something that should have been explored in, gra in grand detail. Yeah. But the local police didn't do that, instead ignoring so many suspicious circumstances, pointing to Jaime Ross. For now, Ross remains behind bars for the Scotiabank frauds, not Maru's murder. After his conviction, he was sent to this prison south of Mexico City to serve a 15-year sentence. U.S. agent Gabe Gonzalez hopes that can at least be some consolation for her family. He's doing 15 years. Whether he does it for the bank fraud or if he did the murder, he is still paying. He is still paying. Uh, that's 15 years of his life that he's in jail. And after seven years of investigating, Scotiabank evidently believed it had recovered as much of the stolen money as it could in 2008, the bank closed its investigation. If the killing of Maru Oropesa was still unresolved, that was a job for the local police, not Scotiabank. I think the, the important thing for us uh, was to investigate thoroughly and to provide that information to authorities. Um, now, what... that's not what they say. OK. Remember the 16 employees never prosecuted for their roles in the Scotiabank frauds? Well, here's where that becomes so important. The bank chose not to pursue charges against the other people who were involved in that fraud, which would, would not it definitively limit the investigation and limit the possibility of finding who killed Maru. I can assure you that if we felt that there was any indication that uh, there could have been a conviction or further information provided to the authorities that would have helped with a conviction, that we absolutely would have turned that information over. In a case involving a murder, shouldn't that be up to the authorities to determine what's important and what's not? We absolutely turned vast amounts of information over to the authorities. In fact, I think there were regular visits with prosecutors mm -hmm. uh, and with the authorities. We went out of our way. We spent millions of dollars, as we should have, mm -hmm. on an investigation. But according to Paul Cialino, those 16 bank staff were arguably the most likely cohort of witnesses, accomplices, even suspects in Maru's murder. There's people that don't have a good alibi. There's people that are in and around the area. There's people who had a strong motivation to kill her. And because those employees were fired by the bank and never criminally charged by Mexican authorities, no one truly investigated those people or scrutinized their alibis. Or motives. If it's my employee, I want it resolved. I, I want justice for this poor woman who worked for me. And, and clearly, uh, 
could have really hurt the people over her. I mean, you know, there's so much motivation to kill her by these people that it's, it's ridiculous not to look at them closely. Especially in a dangerous environment like Mexico, Scotiabank failed to do all it could to detect fraud, or more importantly, prevent it, according to former prosecutor Jose Marmaleo. All the measures that they had the obligation to keep, not just to avoid money laundering, to avoid any crime related to, to money, and uh, they put in risk the lives of all their employees and also to the clients related to, to the bank. And after a dozen years so passionately involved in this case, he goes even farther than that. By common agreement, it seems logical Maru Oropesa's murder was linked to that fraud yeah. in some way. Mm -hmm. I, is it possible that had Scotiabank taken countermeasures to all of this, Maru Oropesa might still be alive? Yeah, sure. Sure. The correct way to finish with this and to get an example to all of those employers that were corrupted was to prosecute those ones who were involved in this case, and they never did it. For all their hope that interest in the investigation may yet be rekindled, Maru's family knows that here in Mexico, so many years afterwards, the chances of that are slim and none. They realize it's far more likely that Maru's murder, along with the vast majority of homicides in Mexico, will remain unsolved, officially at least, forever. Stay with us. We'll be right back.